Good morning. <clears throat> this is um, May 12th, Friday. It's about 9.22 a.m. Hang on a minute. I like to um, I want some grapefruit juice and whatnot in the wallet and everything in there, so I'm going to be careful. Anyway, <clears throat> today, this is part two of the Bundy Encounter of June 5th approximately, this is what I'm guessing, of summer band, Jeb Stewart. And I am 10 years older than Leslie Parmenter. One of the Parmenter boys, Steve, I think, was in one of my classes, I think sixth grade. I have him. He's in, he wrote in my autograph book. Anyway, today's going to be two main topics. Next door is a website we have in Jacksonville. I believe it's all over the country. And I, about two years ago, while I'm doing my research, I put on there, did anybody have any encounters in 1967 in Jacksonville with Theodore Bundy? And secondly, any encounters you may have had over the years with Theodore Bundy? And the other topic will be a, a short, brief topic on Dale Carson, junior and senior. And uh, then also the wild things that gradually separated me from Debbie. I guess she was more mature than me. I don't know. Um, but anyway, and she wanted to get out of a high school and accelerated program. I don't believe she was but in 10th grade at a Forest High School before she uh, went on to some kind of uh, maybe international baccalaureate where you get your BA at the same time. Here. I don't know what happened. But uh, I don't know why she wanted to to get through so fast so that kind of separated us because I was po dunking along okay so now she talked to this man the young guy and I actually said are you in the Navy because I thought he might be something like a lieutenant JG a young officer and because he was wearing khaki shorts he was tan his hair if you look at Leave it to Beaver, there was a certain kind of boy cut. It's straight across the back and short cut. You could tell it had been cut recently, you know, like he had had a cut for his trip or something. And I said, are you in the Navy? And he said, college. He didn't say, I'm in college. I'm going. He said, I said, are you in the Navy? He said, college. And at that point, that's where we were turning around to get on La Moya. And he just really was not talking and I know he'd been talking to Debbie for five or six minutes at some point she gave him her phone number because I don't think we had a lot of writing material because it was summer band but somehow we got a, like a three by three piece of square a square piece of paper and I think he had to give her a pencil or pen but she gave him her phone number and that probably led to a lot of problems um okay that being out of the way, some of the things that Debbie did that were wild. I did go to her 16th birthday party, and some guy was there with a motorcycle. When she got on it, when all, she didn't know how to brake it. She didn't know how to operate it at all, but she just gets on and starts riding. And it was a big old Honda-like motorcycle. And there were, um, luckily, on her street, and actually in Cedar Hills, it kind of rose up, you know, like a curve like this. You know, I'm not flat like that, but a curve up. So I'm doing my three-mile walk. <laughs> These things take forever to download, don't they? Oh, my God. Yesterday was only 24 minutes, and it took most of the day for it to download. Anyway, I got my new settee at the house. I could put it together and get rid of that old tore-up futon the dogs have decimated over the years. So... The birthday party was wild. One time we used to go up to the roller derm, which will become significant later. And every I love the roller derm. I think from about the time of 10 or 11 to maybe 14 or 15, I loved going to the roller derm. We'd go to a lot of Friday nights up to the roller derm. It was a skating rink, and they had an organist, and her mother was an organist. Her mom was a maitre d' in the heart of Jacksonville, which was a hotel and club downtown. And um, she looked like Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, she literally, look up Elizabeth Taylor where she has a white streak in her hair. She looked exactly like Jean Hogue. I mean, exactly. They were She looked, and she played on that because if you're a maitre d' or a barmaid and you have, 
you do yourself up and you look like Elizabeth Taylor and then you play the hip hop music of the time and she was an organist, but there's an eagle's nest way up, up there. I don't know if you can see it. I get so dizzy. See the eagle's nest? I don't know. Can you see it? It's big. It's about half the size of a Volkswagen. All right. So anyway, that may be an eagle feather too. Anyway, she has a couple babies up there. Anyway, you go fishing around here, I guess. I hope this thing's recording. Let me check it real quick. Okay, yeah. So, um, she gave him her phone number, and I don't know what happened. About three days later, I went to Kathleen's, and they had a wisteria, and Kathleen's house was 4110 and 41 whatever, right next to Debbie's house. And Debbie had a chain link fence because at some point, Mrs. Hogue decided she would raise German shepherds. So they had a, a chain link fence installed. So that would have been maybe in the 60s, okay? And Debbie pops over, and I was showing Kathleen about the weird encounter. Because part of me was excited, because you know what time it is, like like the little girls at Delphi. We were, he was a nice looking guy. He looked like Rob Lowe, kind of. Except for the gun and display of his eyebrows and everything. But um, <clears throat> she comes over, and I said, I've written about it in my diary. And she goes, no, you can't have it in your diary. We'll get in big trouble. We were hitchhiking, and he displayed a gun, and your mother will read the diary. So she said, rip it out. And see how, how I don't like that. Something inside of me doesn't like that. So I read the page out, and all I have is a page where it's, you know, now. But, um, and I've tried to get it looked at. All I can make out are these words, college, talking to, bright red, and Theodore. I see a TH, a long, and it's the longest entry in that diary. I wasn't a journalist. My mom wanted me to become a journalist or something. I ended up being, and then medical lab, and I said, well, let's just copy in what the other people are doing. And I ended up as an accountant at IRS, a low-level tax examiner. So anyway, like I was Hispanic, look. Subcontractors. I don't know what they're doing here. Don't talk for a while. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? What was I talking about? Okay. She says, throw it away. So I put it in the fence post, and I've wondered really now, could it still be in that fence post? If I had a, a fence person come and say, look, I'll pay for it, take that fence post out, you know, it's a little bit of an amalgamated fence post, have them take it out and look through it, you know, I don't know. You gotta get past this for a second, okay? Put it kind of this table in here. You know, it can be dangerous. I know some guy downtown was working with the electric system and the whole sidewalk blew up and he died. And the power went off to the federal building, got real hot up in there, and Blue Cross and a hole all along there. And they had to close the offices for the day. But the poor man, he blew up, basically. I don't know what wires he crossed. That was a few years back. Anyway. and acclimate and say, oh, it's hot in here. There's no air conditioning. Go home. I guess you need the computers anyway to work the cases, so I think we did get off that day. Anyway, it's off topic. She goes, we'll get in big trouble. Um, he displayed a gun and we were hitchhiking. We'll get in big trouble. But you know what? I think she was covering for him. He probably gaslighted them and said, look, I was nervous. I just wanted your friend to shut up or so. I don't know. You tell me. I think she was covering for him. Back then, you had one phone in your home. Some people had the princess or the trim line. And um, 
I think in the Debbie's house, they had a phone in the kitchen, which was a communal phone. And remember, it was Jean, Jeannie, Vicky, and Debbie, four women, or four girls and a mother. And mothers uh, had to get assistance uh, because her husband was commander at NASA, but they were divorced. So obviously, there had to be child support. There had to be maybe alimony. I don't know. And Jeannie was already working at Southern Bell. And she was only 18 or 19, so she was a year younger than Bundy. She came up pregnant at some point. And that made me nervous, too, because I was still 12, and I was a kid kid, you know. And then uh, we were playing hide-and-seek at her house one day, and they had had the carport enclosed. And you know how a window has a little ledge on it? Somehow, I squeezed myself up there and held on and hid behind the curtains up on the ledge. And they looked and looked and looked, and finally Debbie said something like, well, I guess she's going home. And then they proceeded to start talking about Jeannie's pregnancy. And I said, oh, nope, I'm, I'm here, I'm going home. Because I was, you know, I didn't want to hear about it. She was unwed. I don't know who her boyfriend was. Then at a point, Debbie says, and I wasn't seeing her as much, and Dad said, why don't you see Debbie as much? I thought she was your little friend for all your life and stuff. And I said, she was just, we were just growing apart. It was unnatural. You know, people people grow apart. She was an accelerated. I was a podunk. She wasn't going to be around that much more. She went on to college early. I mean, even in high school, she was college. She might have been like a dual, you know how they have a dual thing? I wanted to be a commercial artist. So, anyway, <laughs> what was I talking about? I keep losing the train of thought. Anyway, so I think she, they had another phone back towards the bedroom, but it was the same line. It just, you could just pick it up in the kitchen. I think they did that. I think I, In my mind, I think they had one back that way. Because with four women, there are a lot of boyfriends coming and going and stuff. So, anybody could have picked up that phone. Then there was a point, is that the eagle? Could be, see it? I don't know. On. What was I talking about? I think she might've been covering for him. She, he was too good to toss away. She was fatherless. He was just too good to toss away. And he told him some kind of jive ass story about being nervous or trying to get, just put a shock on people or something. Who knows? Remember, I did the math. In 1967, if you ran out of funds and you've rented a Volkswagen and you've gone down for spring break and you're supposed to be in Palo Alto, California, which is about 2,300 miles or something, and you have no funds and you have that stolen gun, which brings up another point. He had that revolver... And there was a girl in the Ron Rob R O B Dillenberger. He's English, but he's got a German name, don't he? But anyway, so Dillenberger, in the back of it shows possible victims of Bundy. There was a girl in May of '67 on something called I-5, which goes from Seattle all the way to Los Angeles, I think, which takes you right on down to Stanford those areas and she and her name was something like Caldwell they found her in a ditch off of I-5 shot 14 or 15 times which is odd because a revolver has what seven bullets so you could reload it once it was overkill and she was cracked on the head or cracked on the head and shot to pieces and there's not a paragraph is like this but anyway, so Debbie's all upset. I mean, she was vehement. Rip it out. Your mom will read your diary. And she'll find out we'll get in big trouble. So there was that. And the birthday party where some guy was in the tub. And I kept being a little short guy. And then we sneak out at night, take the screen out, go meet up with Debbie, and go see the Leonard Skinner guys. I remember Steve Gaines, he had sort of strawberry blonde hair, and the Gary Rossinger had black hair, and we went down to Kevin Elson's. Kevin Elson, at that time, not Mike Kirkpatrick, 
But Kevin, I knew the Kirkpatricks too, kind of, in a roundabout one. It took classes with them. But at that time, Kevin Elson was a manager. And he was he had a single mom and a swimming pool. And we went down there, and the Leonard Skinner guys were in there because they were just like battle of the bands. They were just high school band. <clears throat> and we went into Kevin Elson's and watched Creature Feature late at night and played Monopoly and stuff. We sneak out. I remember Steve Gans. I said, there is a house in New Orleans. And he showed me a G note, you know. Uh, I don't know, something like this. So he showed me the G note, and then there was Gary Ross and Jimmy watched Creature Feeder. And Debbie stayed on. See what I mean, Wild? She stayed on alone with a group of boys, band boys, and she, she wanted to be a singer. Uh, but anyway, so there was that. That was wild. The motorcycle thing was wild. We go to the roller dome, and at one point there was a bowling alley across the street from the roller dome, and Debbie goes, we're going over to the bowling alley. Well, I had no interest in bowling. I wanted to, I loved to skate. I'd go as fast as I could around and around and around. And then at a point in the evening, they turn the, dim the lights and the organ would play some, you know, yesterday, whatever. And then you just pick some boy that will stand beside you and say, would you like to skate? We'd go skating hand in hand around the roller dome. That was the way they ended the evening. Didn't matter, just you just pick a guy. And uh, I didn't want to go across to the bowling alley. Bowling alley. We had to meet up with somebody or something. I don't know. And that was a debacle too. That turned me against drinking and drugs. This is one of our adventures. There was a guy, blonde, cube, uh, cube what do you call it? Little cheeky, cheeky, you know blonde, wavy hair, and he was in like a, a 1950s style Impala with the red, you know, the red seats, white fish tail, you know, the old Impala, of about a 54 Impala, and white, and he was sitting there, and he had a, a six-pack of beer beside us, on the, on the, beside us, the passenger side, because you can see it was convertible, and then there was a girl, and there used to be something called CNC Grocery there and the bowling alley. And we're walking over where I didn't want to go. It wasn't what we were supposed to be doing. And then this girl seemed to be high. There was a lot of drugs on the street in the 60s. There were yellow jackets. and I think she even showed us to her, yellow jackets and red beanies. There were amphetamines mostly. California turnaround, they call them. There were red beanies, yellow jackets. I don't know what they were. I don't do drugs. And she had long black hair, and she got up on that Impala and was sitting on the fender, and the guy panicked for some reason. And he took off. I don't know if he didn't know she was sitting there, and she fell down and cracked her head on the cement. And some woman threw her groceries down and come save the girl because she cracked her head on the cement. And I said, oh, it made me nauseous. And so this is going on over here. What the world? All right, it made me nauseous, and I said, do not drink, do not drink and drive, and do not do drugs off the street. That was it, my lesson learned, that's it. Plus, why are we going to the bowling alley? Why are we going to the bowling alley? I never knew. So then, I'm separating gradually from Debbie as time goes by, and she comes and says, we've got to go up to Riviera Apartment. I don't know anybody in Riviera apartment. By then, Jeannie and Vicky and Debbie and people were dating a lot and everything and breaking up and whatever. So she had like a mint green bicycle with a little basket, or it might have been pink. It was a pastel color. And I think she came to my house first because she needed air in the tires, and she knew my dad could do that. So we put air in the tires, and I had a Western Flyer a bicycle, a blue metallic, pretty tall, and... I probably used to go up to Forest. I mean, this was, I wasn't even seeing her very much. Because remember, once we started going to high school, we were kind of parted ways a little bit. So anyway, she wants to go up to Riviera Apartment, quite far from my home in Cedar Hills. And you had to get on Blanding. People didn't ride on bl their bicycle on Blanding. You rode on the suburban streets. You did not ride on Blanding. So we got there. 
and we rode and rode. it was a second one. I, I made a video a few years ago and it was a second one. It wasn't the first one. So it was way up to Park and Blanning. It was the same road that we, met, you know, got off when we got off with him in 67. And we went upstairs and our bikes were unlocked downstairs and it was a cream. It was white and pastel building. It had like white and then little bricks. Some of the bricks were pastel color. Like, you know, like orange sickle and pale blue and pale green. Just here and there on the building as an accent. But it was mostly just a white building. That building was created in 66 to those apartments. They're all of green now, but anyway. So we go up this narrow hall, or this narrow staircase to the second floor. And there was a guy and he was wearing like corduroy bell bottoms. Average height, slender, black hair, and it was long. And he kept grinning and grinning. And he may have been wearing a turtleneck. I can't remember. If it was, it was like a white turtleneck. And <clears throat> this is the thing. She had like a three-page typewritten note. And I guess it was like a Dear John letter. And I said, oh, hell no. What are you doing? She's giving this guy a Dear John letter from one of her sisters. And I'm thinking, well, we need to go. But I said, can I get it? We had written. I don't know. It might have been fall, but it was still hot. And I went towards the refrigerator, which is right in like the little living room area. And he said, no. He said, I'll give you some water. And there was like a little kitchenette with a giant plate glass window behind it. And he gave us tap water. And I said, oh, you know, I really wanted a nice water, but he didn't want us to go towards the refrigerator. And he's in the corner and there was a shag carpet. And I don't know how to describe him. He looked like Michael Nesmith of the monkeys or something. You know what I'm saying? He had kind of shoulder length hair, not down but where they just started growing it kind of long. I didn't drive yet. So I'm thinking about a year after we met Bundy, maybe a year and a quarter, so 68 sometime. And he was slender, not muscular. Um, he kept grinning and I started getting the creeps. I started thinking our bikes are unlocked, they're downstairs. You know, and I wanted to get out of there. And there was a little island, you know, a kitchen island, like from white from like a, a surfboard shaped oval thing. And above it, there was a bicycle wheel that had a lot of kitchen utensils on it, like spatulas and ladles and knives and different things up on this bicycle wheel. So I thought that was odd. But anyway, I started getting the creeps. I want to go. I was mostly worried about my bicycle being downstairs, unlocked bicycle, you know. And we had a long ride to go back. So that was a weird thing. Could that have been him? Now, let's go back to Jeannie's pregnancy that I mentioned earlier. Now, Miss Hogue said the baby was a boy and was stillborn. And then Debbie came to me one time all hyper, and she goes, Guess what? We had a sheriff named Dale Carson. The other administration apparently had had some corruption and stuff. I knew that guy too. Uh, he was Irish, Cahill. I knew his grandson or something. He, he could speak Irish, but it may not have been the man's fault specifically. I don't know. But anyway, so we had Dale Carson. And the reason I remember it is because one night when I did have my license, I had a 63 white Bel Air and we went out through the front door, put it in neutral. Okay put it in neutral, push it down the driveway, then push it a few feet up past the driveway, and me and my friend, I think maybe Kathleen, we went all the way to the beaches in the middle of the night. Parents didn't know I had the car. See, that's pretty wild. <laughs> but when you got to the intercoastal, there was a sign, and Dale Carson was on it, and it said, Speed Kills. Well, I knew who he was, because he was a sheriff. So it said speed kills. And obviously they meant going too fast kills. But <coughs> since it was the 60s, it was a double entrante and mean speed, the drugs on the street kill, which was also true. You know, so it's like, yeah, 
I hope can be taking speed. You know, speed was a, a drug. Anyway, that's all I knew about the sheriff. His son did not go to our school. We went to Forrest. Went to Jeb Stewart and then Forrest. Didn't know him. Obviously, if he lived in Riverside, which I think he may have, he would go into Robert E. Lee, not Forrest. So Debbie says, guess what? Dale Carson's staying with a girlfriend, Kathy, or something. And I said, you know, we were like 15 or 16. I said, what do you mean? I guess he would have been 16 or 17. I said, what do you mean? His girlfriend lives at their house? I said, well, she must not have a home or something, you know. But, you know, like they were getting it on. I'm thinking, what parents let the children have their girlfriend in the house? And how do you know Dale Carson? I said, how do you know? You know, something like that. And she says, oh, the maid told us. So this is what I'm thinking happened. Debbie's sister was pregnant in 68. And um, Doris Carson was an OBGYN. And she was sort of behind. Uh, but I'm thinking, how do you know, you know, because maybe she actually had some of the clients come to her home. You know, some of the girls that were pregnant out of wedlock or whatever. Maybe they actually came to her home. I don't know. So, because she's talking about a kid that wasn't in her high school. And I said, well, was Kathy in her high school? You know, whoever. I said, she in our high school? That may have been. But she said, the maid said, which puts Debbie in the residence. Or they knew the maid. I said, do you know the maid? You know, I just found it kind of wild. I guess some people peer off for life, though. But anyway... A lot of noise going on. Oh, it's a Range Rover. Some of those are expensive. That's what that boy bought. The girl that was murdered. I don't know. I'm not at British stuff, even though it turns out I am part British, but I grew up thinking I was German and Irish. Turns out I'm a lot of different things. Welsh, Irish a little, a lot of British, whatever that means, but I think that's the Welsh and the Scottish. And then I've got Germanic people, which also 3% Pole over there in Serbia or somewhere. Then I got like 4 or 5% Southern Europe, which is like Italian and Greek and stuff. We're in the world, you know. And I guess when my mom's people were Lutheran, and apparently the Lutherans early, early on would travel around. Ooh, I look like a, well, they're digging up cast iron plants or something. Anyway, all right, so... It just, it's just like, why are all these secrets? And how do you know the Carsons? I mean, it's just like, like, oh, I know the mirror son, but you didn't know the mirror son. You know what I'm saying? They didn't have anything to do with her school. It's very odd. So I have surmised that if they had gone to the residence, it must have involved Jeannie's uh, pregnancy. And who, who was the father? Then at one point, this was odd. Well, Miss Sexton was bipolar. And... One time, Vicky would always take us up to the library. She was such a nice lady, Vicky. She would take me and Debbie up to the Willow Branch Library. And some guy was in the car with us, and he started acting really rude, and talking about, I'll punch your face or something like that, he said. And I said, what a queer. You know, I just, I was like, I was still young then, 13 or 14. I said, well, what a queer. Well, then we started getting phone calls from Miss Sex, and she called my mom and said, this is Mrs. Brown. I know damn well in Mrs. Hogue. My mom just ignored this. You know, she knew I didn't mean nothing by it, but I mean, he was just being rude, and that was a word I knew. All right. I'm going to let it go here at phase one. Thank you. This is part two of the trials and tribulations of Mary's early childhood and the encounter. All right. Thank you.